Hi, my name is Malou Innocent uh, from the Cato Institute, and I'm joined by... Ann Marlowe from home. <laughs> um, we were discussing a little bit before uh, we actually began recording about sort of the issues and the principles underlying, I guess, American foreign policy. And, and you mentioned that you're sort of sympathetic to certain notions or certain arguments that I've made in the past, but I, I was wondering maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit, Anne. Well, in Afghanistan, uh, I've often found myself in discussions with very well-meaning, well-intentioned progressive Afghans who uh, ask for more American help, uh, which may seem uh, amazing to Americans who think we're we're really giving them uh, probably far more help than than anyone deserves. Um, and I say to them, well, you know, you seem uh, unaware that there's many other poor countries in the world. There's many other countries with poor governance, and uh, one of them is um, on our border. I mean, we mm-hmm. could, we could start improving Mexico. Um, right. You know, it was one of the things Afghans don't know, of course, is that there are millions of Mexicans in the United States because conditions in their uh, in their own country aren't very good. So it would probably have a, a much larger impact on life in America to fix Mexico than to fix mm-hmm. Afghanistan. Um, mm-hmm. So I am sympathetic to that, but I but I think that um, in a, in a way this is a singularly poor moment for your point of view because. The recent arrest of uh, Dr. Balawi, uh, the links detailed in the Sunday New York Times uh, with the Pakistani Taliban, uh, mm-hmm. the implied link between Al Qaeda, uh, Pakistani Taliban, attacks in Afghanistan, attacks in the U.S. Um, there's basically a lot going on, which shows that uh, the world's ungoverned spaces can't be left alone. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I definitely think, um, I'm definitely sympathetic also to the notion that uh, the threats to U.S. interests, if we consider it to be, you know, from the realm of non-state actors, uh, these terrorists in certain ungoverned portions of the world. But I think even the recent attack uh, on the CIA uh, uh, intelligence officers in Coast and also uh, the recent foiled attack over Detroit, it sort of underscores my point, which is that and terrorists don't necessarily need one singular base of operations. Uh, they, now there's even talk about possibly going into Yemen, uh, the al-Qaeda linked groups in Somalia, uh, the al-Qaeda leadership in Pakistan. So if this al-Qaeda movement is essentially a loose network of jihadists that are around the world, then I guess even the argument that we must sustain a long-term troop presence in Afghanistan sort of it weakens the argument quite a bit. Um, I do think that there are uh, certain noble intentions, as you mentioned earlier, as far as wanting to try and uh, pull Afghanistan out of the, 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 the impoverishment that we've seen. And I think there have been a lot of gains on the ground, especially when it concerns um, medical care and education. There have been some positive developments. Uh, I guess sort of my overarching fear is that the uh, end state that we want to see in Afghanistan or the end state we hope to achieve may not be done within the time constraints that Obama has laid out. And I guess I sort of want to pick your brain on this and sort of get your thoughts on what you saw in Afghanistan, especially what you highlight in your recent uh, uh, Wall Street Journal op-ed. And you sort of highlight what uh, Major General Flynn spoke about, about trying to restructure in theater intelligence in order to exploit, you know, the distinctions between the population and the Taliban. I mean, how effective have our efforts been, uh, not simply on paper, but in practice? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, basically, not just now, but in the course of uh, five embeds in Afghanistan, um, I've been very disappointed in the quality of American military information gathering. I wouldn't even say intelligence gathering. I would, I would say information mm-hmm. gathering. Um, I've seen very little data collected about the population. Now, if you read David Galula, uh, you know, the Bible right. of counterinsurgency, the first thing that you're supposed to do, and the first thing that most uh, counterinsurgents have done in the historical past, you know, whether in Algeria uh, or Malaysia, um, is to do a survey of the local population. That hasn't been done in Afghanistan. Now, I understand the difficulties, and I also understand the fact that uh, this is not our country. Uh, we can't just uh, go in and go door to door asking people personal questions. 
Uh, the Afghans have to do that, and that's, you know, the capacity on the Afghan side is lacking, as, as I'm sure we're all aware. But uh, very little data has been gathered, even about the population in specific areas where I've been, uh, like Khost over four embeds, uh, uh, Kandahar, uh, Dabul, most recent trip. And I would find that the charts and graphs that the Army produces in great number uh, and which are displayed on a screen in the in the Tactical Operations Center twice a day at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. Um, are almost inevitably territorially based rather than population based. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're allegedly fighting a, a, a population center counterinsurgency, but the information management is all on the territorial side. In other words, the uh, the PowerPoint slides show uh, maps of Zabal or Khost uh, and movements of American forces around the province or insurgent attacks in the province, they show very little to do with the population and very little is known about the population on a statistical basis. Now, good captains and lieutenants uh, anecdotally can tell you quite a lot. And I did see uh, some very effective young officers who were doing the uh, best practice counterinsurgency Tasks uh, at that officer level, such as going to the bazaar, surveying shopkeepers, asking them where they come from, asking them basic economic facts about their villages. Do you have any cars in your village? How many people have motorbikes? How many people have bicycles? Uh, how many people have electricity? To which the answer is usually zero. So there's some good stuff going on at the the um, junior officer level. There is very little being collected. There is almost none being analyzed or displayed. Um, I understand that this actually is happening at a higher than battalion level um, at Bagram, uh, at in Kabul, at ISAF headquarters. There are uh, senior quants who are crunching numbers. Uh, I don't know how good the numbers are because I don't know how they're getting up from the uh, lieutenant and captain level to the, the uh, colonel and general level. But that's one problem that has struck me. And, you know, I I also think, unfortunately, there's a learning curve for journalists who are doing embeds with the Army, and it's really only now, after five embeds, that I feel uh, I have a good idea of what to expect, a good idea of um, what a um, competent lieutenant colonel, captain, lieutenant should be doing, what not to expect from them, um, what the internal standards are, you know, how information makes its way uh, up and down the chain of command. And it's hard to get to that point. So I think a lot of the failures haven't been reported because you don't have people who've spent enough time with the Army. And I'm very sympathetic to the Army, um, you know, still am. Uh, I'm trying to help uh, point to ways they could work better. And I think that they're responsible for most of the -the on-the-ground progress I've seen in Afghanistan. Now, that, in fact, that would bring me back to to your point, which is, well, uh, yes, what have we accomplished there in the eight years that we've been there? And there's been tremendous economic progress. Um, I mean, I think that, Malou, if you were to visit Afghanistan, uh, you might change your mind because you would see that the daily life of uh, many, many people, not all people, but the urbanized and semi-urbanized people in Afghanistan has changed beyond recognition uh, since we overthrew the Taliban. And even in remote rural areas like Zabul, uh, like Khost, uh, like Ghazni, um, there are wells where there were never wells. There's uh, solar-powered electricity in the bazaars where there was never any electricity at all. And most importantly, there are schools where there were never schools, not in 700 years uh, of Islam in Afghanistan, uh, where there are schools in many areas where the American army has built schools. Well, I mean, I guess I would have to say that someone doesn't have to necessarily go to Afghanistan to know that we shouldn't be there. I, my sort of overarching grasp with the mission is that remaining in Afghanistan is not a precondition to making America safe. Uh, the objectives that we went in uh, in October of 2001 was to go after the Al-Qaeda network and the Taliban regime that sheltered them. Uh, We achieved our very limited goals and our limited aims uh, within several months 
of going into Afghanistan. So at least the sort of broader nation building aspect seems to bring us farther and farther away from our original objectives. Number one and number two, what I mentioned earlier, I mean, if again, Al Qaeda does have a global presence, if we are involved, deeply involved in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, and a little bit with our diplomatic pressure on Pakistan, and yet we are still attacked as we saw uh, on uh, Christmas Day just last year, uh, I mean, out of sheer luck, uh, the the explosive material didn't detonate. And so it, it appears to me, at least, that uh, remaining in Afghanistan, remaining in Iraq, remaining in these countries, number one, not only uh, doesn't protect America, doesn't necessarily in and of itself provide a necessary or sufficient condition for keeping America safe, but it also plays into all kinds of hands. And I think that sometimes on the tactical, tactical and operational level, it's fine to discuss the details, but we can't go too far away uh, from the strategic map as far as, uh, you know, in the sense that our military does appear to be bogged down, uh, our strategy and mission appear aimless, even though uh, President Obama laid out his assessment of the war back in March, and that was followed up with McChrystal's assessment in August. Uh, still, many of the uh, people the American public, even though they are typically uh, accepting the, the war rationale now, uh, I'm not sure how long that's going to be sustained for, uh, simply because of the real political costs of sustaining an operation of a sort. And even if you look at sort of the counterinsurgency metrics, I know the numbers are thrown around all the time, um, but again, what sort of change will we be able to achieve with the lack of a perfect policy? And this sort of brings me back to my broader libertarian criticisms or uh, principles and criticisms of war in general, is the fact that we'll never have a perfect policy. Uh, granted, I think uh, Major General Flynn's uh, report obviously can inform uh, you know, us going forward as far as the best policies and the best sort of approach to uh, information gathering and, and culling the right information. But how often and how, how, how many more times we have to recalibrate policy in order to for it to be effective. Uh, I don't know how much time we really do have, uh, whether you're talking about the next 18 to 24 months, the next three years, the next five years, uh, what kind of gradual change that we hope to see in Afghanistan. And in that respect, I just hope that we begin to narrow our expectations of what we hope to achieve uh, and not have these sort of grandiose uh, missions of you know paving roads and building infrastructure. And when in many respects, it, it's not at least apparent uh, to, to many people that that actually gets at the root of why these militants seek to attack the United States. Uh, many of the reasons include, you know, our support for autocratic regimes in the Middle East, uh, our policies toward, uh, as far as Guantanamo Bay, uh, also the ongoing occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I, I think, again, we sort of lose focus of why we're there and what we hope to achieve and whether we can achieve what we, even what we want uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Well, we're not building roads and schools in Afghanistan uh, totally out of the goodness of our hearts, um, nor, I think, because we believe uh, that terrorism stems from poverty. We're building roads and schools because terrorism takes root in ungoverned spaces. And I think the reason I'm pessimistic about our mission in Afghanistan is that we have failed to find a reliable government partner uh, I've uh, been a, a, a longtime critic of the Karzai administration, uh, which I think has only gotten worse. I think there was a sea change around 2006 um, when the corruption uh, started to overwhelm um, any efforts the Afghan people could make on their own behalf. Uh, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to your libertarian agenda. And as a matter of fact, um, up until 2006, 2007, I was convinced that the Afghan people would work their way out of poverty, that they would, through uh, untrammeled market capitalism, which pretty much does exist in Afghanistan, uh, that they would grow their economy to the point where um, it became a much more stable state and where good government almost had to arise in order to protect business interests. But that hasn't happened. I think you've had the worst of both worlds. You've had a sort of kleptocracy at the top uh, combined uh, with a mentality that uh, has become very risk averse because people do not trust that their government can protect them. Uh, mm -hmm. So people are unwilling to invest in their own country. Um, I think that the foreign investment, which looked so optimistic uh, in 2005, 2006, has almost crawled to a halt, except for large, large projects like a, a copper mine that the Chinese are going to be exploiting, and I think, unfortunately, exploiting is probably the appropriate word, uh, mm -hmm. in INAC. Um, 
you know, I would love to see the Afghans uh, do this for themselves. And the Afghans can, are surprisingly capable. Uh, the Afghans managed to switch from having three different currencies to one in a couple of months um, back in 2003 with very little help from us. Uh, the Afghans have uh, gone from the point of having the zero mobile phone ownership to having about a third of adults in the country uh, using a mobile phone. Um, and I think that if we simply had provided them a better government, uh, we wouldn't have to have all the troops we have there now. I'm in agreement, and I, I share with you the feeling that the, the mini-surge in Afghanistan is not the answer. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think having more people, uh, more people doing the wrong things is not going to help, and it will uh, increase the perception that the United States is an occupying power, uh, and that's not our intention. On the other hand, I, I do see a lot of good that the American military presence is doing there. And there's a study, um, I think it was, God, it was a Jamestown Foundation study, I will I will try to um, think of exactly where where it was done, which showed mm -hmm. that countries which have had long term American military occupation are ahead of similar countries in most indicators of economic activity. That there is an effect just of our being there. There's been a huge effect. I mean, every Afghan, let's say, who comes into contact um, with the American military and notices, ah, okay. Um, this is how they communicate. This is the equipment that they have. This is how they drive. They get a cultural input they never had before. If you're living in a remote mountain village in Afghanistan, very often you've had very little contact with your own fellow citizens. Uh, I mean, people have told me in Ghazni um, of being a you know a platoon going up to a little mountain village and having the um, the, the tribal leader there welcome you and not knowing where you came from because they had never seen people from outside the village and they really had no idea if the Americans were Afghans, if they were Russians, um, you know, they had no idea where America was. Mm -hmm. So I, I grant you there's many other countries in the world we could be doing that. Uh, there's many other countries that need that, but we happen to have found one where unfortunately uh, it was a haven for terrorism before we got there. And um, I, I think that you're in danger of making the the, the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, just because we can't eradicate terrorism worldwide doesn't mean we should try to do it when it uh, we should not try to do it when it's staring us in the face. Um, basically, uh, Yemen has been known as a haven for terrorism for some time. I was there in in 2003 during a rare uh, sort of lull uh, in insurgent activity. Uh, in which it was safe to travel throughout most of the country, uh, including the Hadramaut, the area that you know you'll now see in maps as being under the control of Al Qaeda. But it was you know obvious to me that that was a very fragile country, uh, and I it actually by the time I went to Yemen, I had been to uh, Afghanistan several times and to Iraq once, and I thought Yemen was of the three the one where there was least hope for a progressive agenda. Uh, and where the people were, in a way, uh, the most susceptible to radicalization. Well, I think that <clears throat> there's several things. Uh, the notion that terrorism uh, spreads into un ungoverned spaces, even if I concede that, which, which I mean there is a, a lot of uh, available data to suggest that that's true, uh, there will always be ungoverned spaces that militants can find sanctuary in. Uh, I think my overarching point is that in in the United States, in a country of 300 million people, there are going to be people, there are going to be terrorists who get through the net. Um, the best thing we can hope for, at least, is to provide enough security measures in place that that doesn't occur. Um, I don't think that we can go into, say, areas of, of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in areas on the Arabian Peninsula, uh, just trying to sort of whack-a-mole this problem away, uh, because it sort of doesn't get at the root of why it is that these militants want to attack the United States. Again, I think we're sort of getting further away, and not just here in the conversation, I'm talking about in the broader political discourse uh, as to why it is uh, we are uh, uh, constantly sort of in the crosshairs of uh, Islamic militants. And I would say that, I mean, uh, the, the Pashtun insurgent in Afghanistan, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I don't see too many uh, 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 sympathies 
to say, you know, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, uh, and maybe until recently, from what no, I understand. No, I think they have, but I think that invalidates your point. They have absolutely no interest in what's right, happening right, with right. Israel. It, it's Israel very and, much, um, at, but that, but they will still harbor Al Qaeda. Um, right, right, right. I mean, I mean, I think that uh, this is sort of something that uh, uh, Karen's insurgency expert David Kilcullen raises: is that many of these insurgencies are local, regional, indigenous movements, and it's the fact that when we go into a given area, that it stirs support and begins to actually uh, merge uh, otherwise disparate groups against our presence. And so, I, what I fear, I, I guess, is uh, in the long-term presence that you mentioned earlier about. Um, not being an occupation, at least from our perspective, which I agree with, uh, but it being perceived as an occupation by sur- by insurgents, is that the longer we stay, uh, the more it'll push militants to side with Al Qaeda. In fact, we've seen this at least in the Pashtun tribal belt in Pakistan, uh, that the Pashtun base of support that Al Qaeda enjoys is expanding uh, as a result of Pakistani army incursions since 2007, also the aerial drone operations, and so. I guess we, ne- we must uh, begin asking those broader strategic questions. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I remember you mentioned uh, sort of earlier, just sort of getting back at like little notes as you talk, um, regarding the difficulties of, of nation building in general. In fact, you mentioned in your um, Wall Street Journal op-ed, I'll even quote it, <clears throat> in Zalba province this November, I learned from interviews that 80% of the police in the biggest town, Shajoy, don't speak the local Pashto language. I mean... Yeah, it's a very big problem. Yeah, I mean, I mean... I, I, I love the fact that you're sympathetic to my argument, but it's sort of, it's interesting because I, I meet so many people, uh, you know, whether they're, uh, military folks who've served in Afghanistan, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, NGO types, uh, they're sympathetic to my, to my point as well. They say, Malou, you know, it is extremely difficult. Uh, we face a lot of bureaucratic hurdles. There's a lot of turf wars within our own government, independent of what happens in Afghanistan. There's a lot of issues. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, me and those people. At the end of the day, we still have to do far. this, unfortunately. I mean, right. I, I totally reject the Kokolan hypothesis, by the way. Um, oh, the really? Best, Interesting. It's a dreadful book. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't, don't agree with but, he's, yeah. a, he's a smart man who's written a bad book. Um, and I don't, I, I, I reviewed it for the Weekly Standard. Uh, but I, I think that most of the people in the Pashtun Belt who are fighting against us, um, would would a still harbor al qaeda if we left and b uh would still be fighting against the central government if we left and c uh will never uh work their way out of poverty if we leave i mean in places like zabal we are the only hope that the next generation is going to get any education at all uh i mean this was the first province i've been to where their schools were largely closed. The only schools that parents uh, felt secure enough to send their kids to were right outside American military bases. Now, I grant you that's not, we cannot have that as a permanent situation. Um, but if these kids don't get educated, we're going to have a population that is still illiterate. And by 2050, there's going to be 80 million Afghans. That is too many people, too many illiterate people. Uh, for there not to be terrorism in Afghanistan at that time. Um, I, I also have a, a problem with the argument uh, that just because we don't have the perfect strategy doesn't mean that you know we shouldn't keep trying. I mean, one of, as, as you point out, I was shocked to discover that there is no one coordinating efforts to make sure that the Afghan staff, Pashtu-speaking police and Pashtu-speaking provinces. Now, I think there is a shortage of police. Um, there has been a big raise given to the police that happened while I was last there in, in November, December, um, and that has increased recruiting success. Before, the, the police were paid a barely living wage, much less uh, you know, the kind of wage that people would risk their lives for, because the, the police get killed at a rate of about 100 a month in Afghanistan. So it's a, it's a pretty risky job. And what I'm seeing is um, small, incremental improvements being made in Afghan governments and Afghan life. Um, there is a uh, catastrophic failure on the part of the Afghan government to get its own house in order. And unfortunately, if we left, I think that would get worse, not better. I actually had thought in Iraq that the the Iraqis would step up to the plate um, 
and they largely have. But in Afghanistan, I think the kleptocracy is too strong. You've got a very powerful family, the Karzai family, that is stealing the country blind. And that will only uh, be exacerbated uh, if if we are not keeping a very close watch. Now, I personally think we should have made sure that Karzai did not stand for re-election, uh, or that if he did stand for election, um, that we ran a fraud-free election or that if we couldn't run a fraud-free election, at least we made sure that, that the runoff happened rather than pressuring Dr. Abdullah to withdraw. But, you know, those, those are bygones. Uh, we, we, I think we made some dreadful mistakes. Um, the State Department made some dreadful mistakes. The UN made some dreadful mistakes. Uh, but given the, the reality that we have a horrible president in Afghanistan uh, who's just now submitted his second slate uh, of inadequate nominees uh, for cabinet ministers to the Afghan parliament. Uh, we have to keep a presence there uh, to make sure that the Afghan security forces develop at least in a rudimentary form and that over the next few years uh, the next generation of Afghan kids gets an education so that hopefully they can eventually uh, take responsibility for their own governance. And that's just not going to happen if they're all illiterate. Well, I guess I just sort of disagree with the notion that we should be in Afghanistan to help Afghans. I think that Afghans have to take the reign for themselves. I mean, there's a reason. But if they're illiterate, I mean, if they're illiterate, how can they do that? This is, the the country is a product of its history. It's a product of its geography. It is the epitome of a country that has been able able to withstand meddling from external powers. It's a landlocked country. Um, It has been, uh, at least from the surrounding countries, uh, around Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, uh, you know, the Central Asian Republics, Iran, uh, many of these countries, especially throughout the 1990s, have had an in- incentive to exacerbate and manipulate the internal. Yeah, but you're arguing against country, your own. But, you're arguing against your own cause. You're basically pointing out that through through no fault of their own, the Afghans have landed in a disastrous position, which I would ag- agree. You know, and I'm saying that number one, I don't think we can pull the Afghans out of this situation. Okay, uh, I think this is just going. I think it's historical to assume that we can. I think it's extremely difficult, especially given our own constraints, bureaucratically, economically, uh, politically. But then also, I mean, I don't think we've really. I think it's sort of assumed that we should be asking our men and women to, in uniform to fight and die for a policy that's not directly related to our national security interests. Well, we've got uh, a granted, volunteer educating army. Educating Afghans is is one thing. We've got a volunteer the army. I mean, no one is in there. Afghanistan is a precondition to keeping us safe. I mean, again, uh, I I'm deeply uh, you know suspicious of this argument because it's not clear to me uh, that the militants that we sort of unseat in the tribal areas uh, are going to all of a sudden not be moved to another area, relocate and reposition their presence in another part of the world. Uh, and that's sort of the the overarching issue with the Afghan mission is that we're talking about sending another thirty thousand troops and whether or not we can employ counterinsurgency. Uh, correctly, and I mean, you can have a legitimate uh, debate about the efficacy of coin. The issue is whether we should be prosecuting coin or not. And I think that sometimes when we talk about needing to pull the Afghans out of poverty, uh, needing to help them with education, I mean, it, it, uh, I mean, with all due respect, it sort of sounds uh, Kipling-esque. It sounds very much of a sort of a white man's burden. And it's again, it's not uh, clear to me and many Americans exactly. Even if we don't have a perfect strategy, even if we have a good strategy, uh, whether or not Afghans will take up the reins once we leave and how long will it take in order to bring them to a level of self-sustainment that once we do leave, it doesn't implode. Um, my, my, one of my many fears about the Afghan mission is that, uh, whether we leave tomorrow or whether we leave 20 years from now, that it looks exactly the same. It looks as, uh, as, uh, dysfunctional as uh, politically isolated and just as, uh, you know, interfered with by the regional powers as it is today. And I think this is sort of why uh, another ongoing fear that I have, again, I'm, I'm ready to be an optimist, but um, I remember going to, to the region a couple of years ago and speaking with uh, these sort of the, the South Waziri tribesmen about sort of the issue of, of drone operations and the military presence next door. And they were of the opinion that this was a hostile occupation of the region. Uh, and from, from my understanding that this is sort of a self-sustaining insurgency that uh, the Pakistani government has dealt with for, for decades. Uh, then you also have the issue of the Balochi insurgency uh, across the border. And so, I mean, there are many elements to 
uh, our problems with the mission that are independent of what happens in Afghanistan as well. And sort of the, I think we also get uh, get sucked into this sort of vacuum-like thinking of looking at Afghanistan in isolation and not looking at sort of the broader regional context and the fact that for, at least for, from my perspective, many of the Pakistanis that I, I spoke to and met to have, and I'm sure you already know this already, uh, the pervasive uh, sense of paranoia they have about the Indians. And given the increased Indian involvement in Afghanistan, many Pakistani uh, military and the military elite are unwilling to offer enough support uh, to stop allowing militants to pour over the border, simply because they feel that there's going to be sort of a second front uh, on, on their western flank in the event of another war with India. And so they have an incentive to, to sort of keep Afghanistan weak. That's not even counting many of the other countries in this region. So so I just wanted to bring up the, the point about nation building, whether we should do that, whether we should be asking our military to do that, and also just how we've sort of drifted away from uh, the context of Afghanistan and why it is the way it is today. Again, it's not an accident of history that it was bypassed by the Industrial Revolution and that's been bypassed by many modern developments. And well, so I'm just I mean, a but incredulous it, as far as our ability to bring about the change that we hope to see there. It's a it's a difficult mission, but we still have to undertake it. I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, these things aren't always easy. Oh, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, yeah, otherwise, yeah. otherwise, politics, you know, uh, would would be a game for children. I mean, the also the situation you point out. I mean, you were saying that you know the um, the situation in Pakistan is characterized by a domestic insurgency that's ongoing, which is absolutely true. But that doesn't mean that. And you know that is in in a way that's a uh, an argument against uh, part of your case because the the Pakistani insurgency um, needs to be ended by its own government and we should be putting much more pressure on the Pakistanis. I mean, this is happening to some extent uh, to do so because uh, you you can't have an ongoing insurgency in a, in a country which has nuclear weapons and that has 160 plus million people. Uh, that's but, not but acceptable. Deal. And, well, I'm, I'm speaking from a standpoint of someone who thinks that eventually there should not be ungoverned spaces in the world. That we, unfortunately, we now live in an interconnected world where none of us are safe unless we're all safe. Uh, that is the thrust of the neocon argument. And I think that the events that happened, uh, on Christmas Day, uh, the attack in Holst, um, a lot of these things have shown uh, I mean, Major Hassan, I mean, look where the cleric that um, all of these folks uh, are in allegiance to is living in Yemen, uh, an American citizen who fled to Yemen uh, and is, is fomenting messages of hate from Yemen uh, and inciting murder from Yemen. That To me, that doesn't mean, uh, okay, we pull our troops out of Afghanistan. It means we put we give some stabilizing pressure to the Yemen, Yemeni government, uh, which is not easy. Uh, I grant you that. I absolutely grant you that. Having been there, um, I was actually rather depressed about Yemen um, in that it, in Afghanistan, I would say the northern part of the country uh, and maybe 10% of the Pashtun belt have a generally, uh, I wouldn't say progressive, but let's say uh, hospitable to democracy uh, and good government uh, attitude. They want to have a civil society. They want to be able to to walk and talk with their neighbors in public. Uh, they want their children to go to school. They want to have small businesses. Uh, all of, most of those things in Yemen, uh, I think, were very problematic. Um, I saw a society there uh, that was extremely insular, uh, extremely uh, tribally and, and family centered, much as in Afghanistan. Um, with very little pulling it to the center. And if you have poppy in Afghanistan, well, you have cot in Yemen. You know, you have basically a society of drug addicts. Um, so I saw very uh, bad things in Yemen when I was there in the summer of 2003. I was only there for three weeks. Uh, but to me, that didn't argue that we ought not to get involved. It argued that we ought to get involved because that place is going to be a trouble spot. Uh, and we need to bring influence to bear on our ally, our nominal ally, Saudi Arabia. Uh, many Yemeni men work in Saudi Arabia. They're becoming radicalized in Saudi Arabia. I mean, you can see that in a very basic and, you know, non-dangerous but annoying sense in that uh, Yemeni women uh, used to wear headscarves when they worked in the fields. Uh, you know, it's primarily agricultural country. 
Now you see them wearing the cobs, which are the face masks, the black face masks, which only show the eyes. Uh, that's because their husbands brought them back from Saudi Arabia, where they uh, they became perceived as a status symbol. You know, as soon as your husband got some money, he brought back a TV, a car, and a face veil for you. Uh, only super upper class Yemeni women used to veil their faces. Now almost everyone does. Uh, that's not a development that helps with civil society. Um, and it's not something we can do anything about. Uh, but it is something that uh, is taking place and will take place uh, and is changing the world. I mean, we unfortunately, history does not stand still, and we have to respond to that as what? as the as the power that is guaranteeing the security of most of the world. Well, I question whether or not we should be guaranteeing that security to the rest of the world. Well, but what's funny, I think, from it? our conversation is that it appears that, from what you're saying, a lot of what I'm saying you say hurt, helps your point, and a lot of, I find what you're saying helps my point. Ah. So there's sort of like an inverse relationship here. Uh, and this is sort of what I've noticed in debates over Afghanistan is that um, everyone agrees on the uh, assessment that the war is very difficult, it'll be very difficult to achieve our objectives, and then we simply diverge at the conclusion. So I think uh, on many of these issues, there's more yeah. points of agreement than disagreement. Um, the only uh, couple things I'll raise, uh, I just wrote yeah. them down so I wouldn't forget, is the first is, I, I think also within Washington, we have a, uh, we typically oversell uh, the level to which we can put pressure on the Pakistan. Um, it's again, it's not a mistake that 80% of the Pakistani military is still on the border of India, uh, not Afghanistan. Again, uh, given the sort of uh, pervasive sense of fear and paranoia that they've had with a country that is, you know, six times their size, they've lost three full-scale wars, uh, it'll be very difficult uh, to get the Pakistanis on board uh, simply because the Pashtun tribal belt that you know that straddles both Afghanistan and Pakistan um, has needed to be pacified at least by the Pakistani government uh, in order to make sure that the Pakistanis on their side of the border or the Pashtuns on their side of the border don't become uh, more royal, uh, riled up. And I think this is sort of historically what we've seen is that the Pakistanis have perceived Afghanistan to be their strategic backyard. We may not like that, but again, unless there is some sort of diplomatic initiative, again, this probably has to be behind closed doors behind the scenes discussing Kashmir as well, uh, the extent to which the proxy groups that Pakistan covertly assists and supports in terms of all and I too sometimes, uh, that must be addressed and that can't be addressed with simply more troops. Uh, and I'm sure you'd agree with that as well. I mean, yeah. also, yeah. this isn't about the surge. And so, Again, we sort of have to ask, does present policy resolve, resolve the underlying sources of the Afghan mission's vulnerability? I don't think they do. Uh, hopefully there's something being done behind the scenes to sort of uh, get more Pakistani support. But again, it's sort of constrained by their own existential fears of India. Uh, that's number yeah. one. Number two, uh, you mentioned about the change, the culture. Well, actually, can we, just, can we just talk, before we head off into another topic, um, oh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, like a, a yeah. minute about I'll, Pakistan. I'll start <laughs> well, just a minute about Pakistan that, that mm -hmm. um, yes, everything you say is true, uh, we have really failed to exert the considerable leverage we have over Pakistan, and we have leverage of money. I mean, we're the ones that are that are financing that state. It's also a very corrupt state. Um, all of the people who we have who have been our interlocutors there have have stolen us blind. And I got very annoyed actually. Um, I was at a benefit dinner this past spring, where the Pakistani ambassador to the United States, Hussein Haqqani. Mm -hmm, uh, spoke, mm -hmm. a very smart man who I, I met years ago, uh, long before he was an ambassador. Um, and he said, well, the United States should be financing schools in Pakistan. And I, uh, putting on my Malou, uh, <laughs> my Malou mask, uh, said, no, we shouldn't. The Pakistani government should be financing schools right. in Pakistan. And if, uh, you know, Benazir Bhutto and her family hadn't stolen the country blind, there would be plenty of money for financing schools in Pakistan. You know, the argument, of course, mm -hmm. is that parents send their kids to the madrasas because they're free, whereas the Pakistani schools, which are very inadequate in most rural areas, require that the student pay for uniforms and school books, which is an obstacle for the poorest of the poor. Um, so basically, we have given tons of money, billions and billions of dollars to Pakistan, uh, they have largely uh, wasted uh, and stolen that money, American taxpayers' money. And there should be far more outrage about that. Um, you know, that country needs to get its house in order, too. 
Um, and I think, I think it does. Both, it faces an existential threat, and we are we are helping the Pakistani government uh, to prop the Pakistani government up. Uh, and we need to get it to do our bidding more. I mean, that's just reality. Well, well there's even a problem because we depend on Pakistan for counterterrorism assistance. They have a lot of Pashtun informants in the tribal areas that we use for uh, for intelligence gathering and for counter uh, counterterrorism operations. And also, we're dependent on Pakistan to the extent to which 50 to 75 percent of our supplies for Afghanistan go through uh, Pakistan, uh, especially through Karachi port. And so, I guess in in some yeah, respects, but that brings the Pakistanis uh, they're dependent money. on us. I mean, they're quite happy. To, they're quite happy about that. There's oh, an absolutely. enormous influx of revenue. Oh, from yeah. Pakistan. They'll, they'll gladly take billions of our dollars, roll out the red carpet, smile to our faces, and institute their own policies. This is, this is sort of, uh, this actually sort of helps my argument in the sense that there are factors immutable to the mission uh, that will impede our progress, uh, irrespective of what happens in Afghanistan, simply because of the, the sort of regional problems with Pakistan. Even if we took a harder line with Pakistan, again, they share a, a, a you know a fifteen hundred mile border with Afghanistan. Uh, who's to say that the Pashtun militants on one side won't easily go through the hundreds of unguarded checkpoints along the border? Well, but that's an argument for having so more border guards. I mean, right but, now, like uh, in, in Zabul, I mean, we I can't s- seal we can't seal the U.S. Mexico border. How are we going to seal the Afghan Pakistan border? I mean, again, we sort of have to understand the, the, the constraints that we're under. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, if we could, or within a reasonable time for the, uh, you know, for these policies uh, to, to reach their goals, then fine. Uh, but given the constraints, given the fact that we can't get the Pakistanis on board, given the fact that, you know, Barack Obama is a political creature, uh, he's sort of going to have this problem years down the line if we haven't, uh, you know, sort of narrowed our objectives and narrowed the mission down. Uh, so, again, I mean, what I've noticed, at least, and this sort of dovetails to my next question about the cult- cultural constraints you mentioned uh, and sort of the ungovernability aspects of this all, I mean, given the uh, a lot of what you've written about the problems with Afghanistan and the mission and our inability to, you know, uh, have quality information gathering, I mean, how can we sort of help the ungoverned portions of the world. We can't even get it right after eight years in one country. And granted, I'm not saying that it has to be a perfect strategy, but given the overlapping problems and the ongoing problems with one mission, how can we have the capacity to bring about sort of the sweeping societal changes that we want to see in other regions well, there is a that learning would possibly curve. be hospitable to all, to all there, there. there is a learning curve. And, and you know what? Um, these wars have been great for our army. Um, there's been an enormous evolution in our military over the last eight years, uh, which has also hurt the military. You'd say the repeated deployments have also hurt the military. I mean, I've heard no, it from both sides, though. I've no, heard it from both sides, though. No, no, no. I've heard no. it from both that's, sides. That's, that's, that's garbage. I mean, the, yes, there, there are, um, people who've been deployed too much, um, you know, but there's a survey done. Uh, which is at the at the back of a of a new book by Mark Moyer of the Marine uh, uh, Corps University called uh, A Question of Command, um, which surveys uh, officers in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and almost as many of them thought that their terms of deployment were too short as too long. I mean, people join the military because they want to serve. They want to do something. They don't want to sit in a garrison. Nothing, nothing, you know, that's a completely meaningless life for them. But we don't initiate wars um, or train our military. We have a voluntary we fight wars in order to protect military. the United States, though. I mean, we have a voluntary we, we, military. You know, I know that. We, I know that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, what I'm saying is that I think that the the argument that we should bring them home where they can we, they can sit at home is rather a silly argument. That's not what they're why they joined, and that's that's not why they exist. Uh, no, I mean, they don't exist about... to sit on bases in the United States. And but, but again, I mean, we don't fight wars to train the military. We fight wars to protect the home. We fight, we fight. And if the, if the mission, if the policy that our military is being set out uh, to, to pursue is yeah. not in keeping with what keeps America safe, then there's some tension in our strategy. Well, we, we disagree about that. Policy. I mean, I think that we cannot, you know, A, I don't think we can keep America perfectly safe. There's obviously going to be be some risks. Uh, There are obviously going to be incidents that occur. Um, As you say, I mean, we haven't even had, thank God, we haven't even had uh, a terrorist incident involving someone coming up from the Mexican border, you know? Mm -hmm. You can can Mm -hmm. have a, a, a Pakistani terrorist who decides to come up through the Mexican border and uh, blow himself up in L.A. That hasn't happened yet. Um, The Problems of ungoverned spaces, though, to me, don't mean that we should we should just throw up our arms and stay home. Uh, they mean we should 
uh, use our military and our cooperation with other countries' military and uh, militaries and uh, our diplomatic service um, to make fewer of those ungoverned spaces vulnerable to terrorist infiltration. I mean, one of the, the things that shocked me in Afghanistan was that the border that Zabul shares with uh, Pakistan, which is in one of the worst areas of, of Pakistan, an area that you know is, is a completely ungoverned space, um, it's 100 kilometers that is policed by only uh, 60, sorry, it is 64 kilometers that is, is policed by only 100 Afghan uh, border police who have no mentors um, who are out there doing God knows what. And uh, we've got to fix, those are simple, fixable problems, you know. Uh, there are enough unemployed people in Afghanistan that you could put an Afghan border policeman, you know, every 10 feet along that border. Uh, and that would stop infiltration. Um, there are some basic things that haven't been done. Um, we, I think we've had some people stationed in the wrong places, too many people on the big bases, uh, too many people maybe on, on some of the wrong missions. Um, and I don't think that any of that is an argument for letting more borders be unpleased or letting more countries uh, have poorly trained militaries. Well, I guess, um, are, are you familiar with Rory Stewart? He, of course, uh, yeah. Yeah, he, he wrote this piece in the uh, London Review of Books that I just thought was was amazing. And he sort of brings up the point about Pakistan in the sense that, and, you know, he is also very skeptical of the mission, as am I, and as are you. Uh, but he mentioned He was defeatist that, in Iraq. Yeah. He was a defeatist in Iraq. I heard him talk yeah. on Iraq. He was wrong. He was well, wrong. Well, Iraq isn't necessarily... He was wrong about yeah, Afghanistan, I mean, and he was wrong about Iraq. We, we, we replaced in Iraq, we replaced a Sunni dictator with a Shiite dictator, and that's for an next Heads. But the the issue that Rory is is that we can see in Afghanistan for another thirty years, and maybe it'll be half as good as Pakistan. I mean, if you look at Pakistan, almost half its territory is ungoverned, as you mentioned, uh, not only including in the Fatah region, but portions of northwest frontier province and Balochistan. I mean, but Pakistan's very that culturally has quite different from, 60, the, uh, from that, the Pakistanis, and it's a different country. There's there's you know, it is a very, Pakistan is a, no, 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 but there's a very significant thing that that you know, I, I didn't read Rory's piece, but the um, Pakistan has a huge feudal uh, population, oh, basically yeah. a population of, of disenfranchised peasants that never existed and doesn't exist in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a country of dirt poor uh, freeholders, uh, of of small small farmers who who farm usually inefficiently small uh, land holdings. But it is not a, a society with a feudal underclass which Pakistan has, and it is not a society uh, which has. Um, Huge urban slums full of, uh, of unemployed or, or underemployed, uh, men who are sitting around being radicalized. It's a very different society and the northern part of the country, uh, which I think is our best hope, um, is a multicultural group with Tajiks, with Uzbeks, with Turkmen, uh, who largely don't have the cultural pathologies of the Pashtun. Uh, they are much more like quote, other peaceful third world countries where people are just concerned with sending their kids to school, um, getting getting ahead financially, uh, and living in peace. They do not have a jihadi agenda. They're not hospitable to jihadis. Uh, they mind their own business. You know, they cultivate yeah, yeah. their own I gardens. Mean- we definitely shouldn't take Afghanistan or Pakistan monolithically. I mean, there are there are things that'll work in Mazari Sharif that wouldn't work in Kandahar. Exactly. There are things that'll work in Alaska that wouldn't work in Florida. I mean, that's definitely the case, and I would agree with that. Uh, but you mentioned that it was sort of simple if we sort of were able to get enough, I guess, frontier corpsmen to patrol the Balochistan side of the AFPAC border. And I think the problem with that is no, that's that not Balochistan. You mentioned- I mean, that's that's just I, I mean that's a whole other issue. But uh, that part of Afghanistan. Uh, actually borders the, you know, Waziristan. Uh, but the, the border police issue, uh, is something that we've been working our way around to. The training of the Afghan police has lagged the training of the Afghan army. No, that's not good. Uh, and part of it is a cultural issue. The army tends to like to train the army. The army doesn't tend to like to train the police. Um, Part of it is a uh, numbers issue in that our NATO allies have not stepped up to the plate and offered embedded training teams. Uh, in Zabul, the only uh, non-Americans are uh, a bunch of Romanians who are doing a pretty good job, but Romania is a very small country. Uh, if some of our larger allies would step up to the plate uh, and provide, you know, 
5,000 or 10,000 men who can be policemen uh, to train the Afghan police, we would be a lot further along in securing those borders. Well, and again, sort of, I mean, going along with the sort of inverse nature of our conversation, I mean, that sort of, again, that sort of supports my point in the sense that if you're talking about a sort of global counterinsurgency campaign of going after other ungoverned spaces that is not exclusive to Afghanistan and also the tribal areas of, of Pakistan, even if, if I concede that, and I would agree with that, all these counterinsurgency missions are context-specific, how many years can we dedicate of constantly recalibrating our policy to meet the expectations both of the military on our side, but also of the people that we're trying to help? Uh, I'm, again, I mean, I don't disagree in the notion that I want to see change. I want to see this. But number one, should we be fighting uh, this battle when it's not directly related to our national security? Number one. Number two, uh, given the real constraints, and I feel like a broken record, I apologize, but again, we are operating under real world constraints. We cannot be in Afghanistan uh, for several decades. Well, we actually uh, we could. Don't. I mean, no, we actually uh, could. It would no, actually make almost no that. difference I mean, to the living what's standards funny is of that Americans. My, I, one of my friends here, actually, who, who does mostly, um, you know, social security uh, analysis, you know, we always joke about all the time about how there's going to be a knife fight one day between the DOD and AARP. Uh, we are going to have to make certain cuts in either our entitlement programs or in the Pentagon years down the line. This is an impending doom. No, that's a, that's a, a, that's a Malthusian happen. argument, you know. Where <laughs> no, we don't, it's, we don't not, it's not a zero-sum game. Our economy expands. Budget. I mean, well, our economy expands, and, and don't forget that all those people in the military are earning salaries. I mean, a lot of those people might not be employed or might not be uh, as, as employed uh, as they are. Um, basically, the military is employing the people who have the highest unemployment rate in our society who are young, non-college educated men. Well, I wouldn't think that, I don't think that the DOD should be an employment system. Again, I think that we need a military to keep America safe, not to train our military. We don't need wars to sort of uh, enable people who are unemployed to see, to get jobs. No, no, but I'm pointing out that, that it's not that, that the military, uh, are at this point bolstering a fragile economy. Uh, Of course, I don't think the economy is going to be fragile forever. And I'm much more optimistic than you are about our ability to pay for uh, the security of Afghanistan as well as the retirement of of uh, our own aging population. I mean, again, not a zero-sum game. Um, also, there's a ancillary effect in that the stronger we can make countries like Afghanistan, the more trade they will have. Some of that trade is going to be with us. I think we, we actually are one of Afghanistan's major trading partners right now, although Pakistan is another. Uh, and the more uh, prosperity worldwide will will come from uh, our effort over there. I mean, if Afghanistan's uh, GDP per capita has just about tripled in the time that we've been over there, um, that helps everybody. You know, we live in one interconnected world, and that unfortunately is the problem with the with the libertarian view, which I'm otherwise, uh, you know, in theory very sympathetic to is that I think a lot of, of the libertarian arguments against global intervention uh, no longer make sense. Uh, well, see, this is the thing. I mean, the notion that we can change Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, there's but we don't a have to change it. We just have, can we, we change it or should we change it? But we don't have and to change it. We just have to make okay. it a this government is space. This you were talking about. Well, I mean, earlier in the conversation, you were talking about uh, implementing ec- education programs, trying to bring... Yeah, but you uh, can't have a government without market. with illiterate people. I, you I mean, cannot have a stable government that with illiterate people. But it presumes um, that we need a stable government in order to keep America safe. I, I think that's sort of the distinction. That, that's where we diverge, I guess, is yeah. that I don't see Afghanistan as a critical component in our national security. Uh, and it so, should so be, but unfortunately it diverge. is. It shouldn't be. It's a tiny, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's a small, obscure country a long distance away, but unfortunately it's where terrorists have chosen to roost. I mean, it is still a destination, you know. The training camps on the Pakistani side of the Afghan border are still a worldwide destination for aspiring suicide bombers, no matter what country they come from, even from this country. I mean, there's, there's, you know, the eerie, the eerie, uh, uh, what, however many people there were, I mean, various people have been apprehended in the last, you know, year or two are still going to training camps over there. And basically, you, as you point out, uh, Pakistan has had ungoverned spaces for 70, 80 years. Um, if you if you don't shut down the Afghan side, uh, you're not going to have any leverage at all on the Pakistani side. I mean, it, it, 
what would happen is simply those camps that are now on the Pakistani side would be ten times larger, uh, and they would be on the Afghan side as as well. Um, mm-hmm. um, you know, for example, I think you, you and I both agree that the United States has to fight smarter uh, rather than harder or bigger. Um, and we both agree that we have to use our diplomatic leverage on, on Pakistan. Uh, I mean, I think we, we both agree that we should have modest expectations of what we can achieve in Afghanistan and the time frame that they can be achieved in. Um, maybe what we disagree on uh, is the necessity of undertaking these missions at all. Uh, I was an M pro Iraq war uh, as well. Um, I don't think we can or should be engaged everywhere in the world. Uh, but if we pick our fights, uh, I think we can help to uh, to improve the uh, living conditions for um, many people, which will improve trade and raise global prosperity. Uh, and we can, more crucially, um, bring better governance and more governance, more government presence uh, to many areas. Um, the issue of, of just having a government presence is important. I guess that that's something I should say in closing, that there are many areas in Afghanistan and in Yemen um, where there was no government presence. There were no cops. Uh, there was no uh, equivalent of a mayor. Uh, there were no representatives of the central government. So it's very, very easy when you have that situation for a radical cleric to come in, start a madrasa, uh, and essentially be the law in town. And that's what the Taliban did. Uh, that's what Wahhabi clerics uh, are doing now in Yemen with Saudi money. Um, basically, uh, when you have an ungoverned space these days, someone is going to use it. Uh, those ungoverned spaces are no longer... Um, uh, outside the global um, reach of radicalism, uh, particularly radical Islam. And I think that just as uh, Richard, Richard Rosecrans wrote a very influential article in Foreign Affairs uh, in 1996 uh, called The Rise of the Virtual State, which posited that the essentials of a state are no longer territory, but it's people, their talents, and the, the trade uh, that they can conduct. Um, a very potent argument. What he didn't anticipate was the rise of the virtual anti-state uh, of different terror networks, which also uh, don't depend on having a physical territory, uh, but on their global reach and their ability to, to seamlessly shift operations from one country to another, which you see happening now. Uh, when Pakistan gets hot, they'll move to Yemen. Uh, if Yemen gets too hot, they'll move to Somalia. If Somalia moves too hot, they'll move to northern Nigeria. And, you know, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying that we have evolved a military yet, which is capable of uh, dealing with all of those threats. Uh, but it's it's unfortunately a struggle we have to undertake, you know. Uh, we don't have a choice. Okay. Well, uh, as far as your assessment of our agreements and disagreements, I would agree with them. <laughs> uh, I'll also just make uh, three other points, I think. Uh, number one, uh, Georgetown University professor Paul Pilar, he used to work at the CIA, uh, CIA's Counterterrorism Center in the 1990s. Uh, he's found that the, uh, the preparations most important for September 11th did not take place in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, but rather in, uh, you know, hotel rooms in Spain, uh, apartments in Germany, and in flight yeah, within the United States. And yeah. so, in, yeah, and in many respects, that's definitely true. I mean, it's not so, so much where, uh, militants find sanctuaries, whether or not they can find sanctuary within the United States. And that sort of gets to the point about, you know, this recent uh, Christmas Day uh, uh, foiled attack, I guess, foiled by the person who's trying to perpetrate it, uh, as far as what would be necessary to keep an American safer. Uh, so, again, I guess we I just sort of disagree about whether or not Afghanistan's uh, uh, critical to keeping, uh, you know, our homeland safe from terrorism. And, in fact, I think this sort of goes into my second point, is that I think we risk playing into al-Qaeda's hand. Uh, the, the person, I think, who... Uh, was most overjoyed with the influx of 30,000 more troops uh, that Obama laid out last year was uh, al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden's leadership. 
Uh, they want to see the United States bogged down in an intractable, bloody guerrilla war uh, for as long as necessary. His stated objective is to, quote, bleed America to the point of bankruptcy. Uh, for every 1,000 troops, it costs uh, roughly $1 billion. And so I do think there are cost constraints and there are political constraints as far as what we can do uh, in the years ahead. And number three, even uh, the, the idea of trying to alter certain characteristics within Afghanistan, such as the education and bringing up development, economic aid, etc., I think these are sort of changes that can't be forcibly imposed by a foreign power, regardless of how uh, uh, popular our measures might be. I think for those changes to be self-sustaining, they must grow organically from the bottom up with the people and not be imposed from the top down. And so I think I'll just uh, end it right there. And I'd hope at least that we get to discuss this more in depth uh, on a later blogging heads because I found this extremely interesting. Well, that would be great. Thank you very much. I, I've also enjoyed our talk quite a lot and uh, and hope we can meet again virtually. <laughs> exactly. Great. Thank you so much again, Anne. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.